Hello, Podicumans, and welcome to another episode of the Podicesis Podcast, a podcast about what Christians believe and why it matters. I'm Brett Maddox, and once again, we are joined by your very best friends in the entire world, Alan Kaysen and Jim Morrow. How are you guys doing? I am doing okay. (laughs) (laughs) Just okay. (laughs) Well, you know, just some days are okay days. Yes. I'm doing great. It's good to be with you guys. Thanks for finally faking it so that we didn't feel awkward about it. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad to be with everybody. I'm feeling uh, quite feisty today and uh, I have no idea what's about to come out of my mouth. Yeah. So we may be muting. Beep. Yeah. If you find, (laughs) if you find a resignate or a firing announcement for me from the podcast before it drops, this is just, uh, just don't worry about it. Fair warning. (laughs) Yeah. I might get fired today. Alan Alan Kaysen wants to announce that um, we have a new sponsor to the podcast, Diet Coke. Oh Diet Coke is uh, going to be sponsoring the the podcast today. You know what I love, man? I love Diet Coke. Oh, it's so delicious! It's that 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 chemically sugary, <laughs> bubbly. You know what I like the most? Actually, sometimes I just pour a bit in a big, wide rimmed glass and just look at the beautiful caramel. We, color. we know you. We know you take Diet Coke baths, so um, and the bubbles just and it sheens, and I can sometimes see the reflection of my, yeah. my own so, eyes. So that everybody is clued in <laughs> on what's happening here. Um, we're we're in the season of Lent, and uh, I have chosen to give up Diet Coke and. Uh, As of the recording of this podcast, I'm on severe withdrawals. Yeah, and and what we're doing, just so you know, this is not mean. It's actually it's an it's an it's about it's about His Holiness. So what we're doing is we're giving Him the opportunity to amplify his commitment to Christ yes. by increasing his craving <laughs> for I, Diet Coke. I feel the holiness <laughs> dripping off of you. This is what this is what good. Christian friends do. This is right. This is what accountability feels like. Alan is growing in in his sanctification. I'm about to walk off. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So uh, anyway, um, as y'all know, you can find us um, on social media at Potikisas is where you can find us on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook. And as always, leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Um, we've only got a couple more to go, and then Alan <sighs> gives his... <laughs> Get him just opened up a can <laughs> oh, of some Jim. soft drink. Uh, I thirsty. In front of, oh, gosh. Oh, this is so great. Anyway. Is... <laughs> um, I don't even know. Oh, Jim, you shared your story about Patrick Stewart. So all we've got to do now is listen to Alan, but we can't do that until we get about four more um, reviews on Apple Podcasts. So you may uh, not do it because I may not be a part of the podcast after today. <laughs> hey, real quick, I'm going to tell you a fast story. Alan, do you remember the time um, that you weren't eating? You were doing the Daniel fast. Yes. And this is back when we lived in the same community and we yes. would go to lunch every week. And, um, I would eat nothing but grilled chicken nuggets, right? Well, we we went to uh, we went to Shoney's a bunch oh, for the buffet, and I was like, you know what, Alan? Because I love you so much, I'm not going. I'm going to follow this fast with you when I eat with you. But there's nothing like limp Shoney's vegetables for lunch yes. that you pay for. So I regret it so much that I just opened a Coke Zero. <laughs> We might need to pull this part off the air. Carry yeah, on. I don't Let's know. Talk about I Jesus. love this. I love this. This is awesome. Yeah, Brett's just sitting back watching. Because we're not just... picking on Brett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> All right, before they, they turn on me, let's go ahead and get started with the catechism this uh, today. So uh, we are looking at a couple of questions that are dealing with um, what God requires us, uh, of us to escape um, the wrath to come, if you will, or the judgment of sin. So last episode, we talked about um, what is required of us due to our sin or disobedience. Um, now we're moving into and at, we're, we're moving into the role of Jesus and the role of salvation um, in, in all of this. And so we're looking at a couple of questions, a few questions here that talk about what is required or what does God require of us to um, move from disobedience to being transformed into the people we were created to be. So uh, we're going to start right off with that uh, that first question, and um, it is, 
what does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life with the diligent use of all the outward means by which Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption. Okay. So uh, a lot going on in that answer there, but really kind of central to this is this God requiring of us putting our faith in Jesus Christ, which brings up another question what that is what is faith in jesus christ well uh faith in jesus christ is a saving grace by which we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel and so then what happens in this catechism is then if if faith in jesus christ is this saving grace then how do we receive it how do we turn to it and there's this word that's used in the um, in, in the Bible in the church that we've talked about a little bit before, but we're really going to get into now, and that's that's the word repentance, meaning to turn away from or to turn towards um, Jesus. So, uh, what is repentance unto life then? Repentance unto life is a saving grace by which a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin, in apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. And that is a hard sentence to say. <laughs> it was it was difficult. Yeah, I don't think they had grammarly. <clears throat> <laughs> by the way, our podcast is now not sponsored by Grammarly. <laughs> no, it is not now. No, not ab- absolutely not. So uh, we're going to look at some scripture proofs here, and we're going to go f- First of all, and just say the scripture proofs for these sets of questions, they're, they're okay. But again, it just shows that it's, they're looking at words. It's almost like someone's going through a concordance, found, okay, this word is in this verse, and then they just put the verse in. Um, so we may share a few passages that are not part of the actual scripture proof in the catechism itself. Um, but we're going to start off with this first question and um, and, and look at um, and look at this idea of what does God require of us um, that we may escape his wrath and the curse due to us. And so, um, uh, Jim, did you say you had Isaiah or am I just making that? Yeah, up? I'm going to, I'm going to read a couple here okay. uh, real quick, uh, a verse from Isaiah chapter 55, verse three. Yeah. Um, and it says, give ear and come to me, listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. And this, um, while doesn't quite get to repentance, it starts to give this life or death kind of decision um, that come to me that you may live. And it's also the idea that in order to do so, you, you've got to willingly come. You've got to choose to come to God. As fleshed out a little bit more throughout, but an example would be the scripture proof from Acts 20, verse 21. And it says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And by Jews and Greeks, uh, the company that that's being spoken to here, that's going to basically be everybody. Um, while today we might say, hey, that's just uh, certain groupings of people, the people that were being spoken to um, and ministered to, that would be the entirety of that group. Yeah. Um, and so that's helpful to know. I mean, that's absolutely, that's helpful to know about, um, the entirety of that group. This is something that is being offered to everyone. Right. Um, and this is not just for one group of people, one, you know, this is for the, everybody, the entire, the entire world. Um, and so I do think that is that is helpful. I, I'm going to read a passage from Romans that will also then lead into a passage um, from Galatians that really ha- um, hammers out, I think, the faith in Christ piece. These two questions, questions 85 and 86, really go hand in hand with each other. So what does God require of us? Well, God requires faith in Jesus. So then what is faith in Jesus and what does it what does it mean? So I'm going to read to y'all a passage um, from Romans chapter three. So let me get pulled up here. Um, And this is from the, toward the end of Romans chapter three, excuse me. 
But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, um, or some translations will say through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to keep oh. it at I'm going to keep it at actually that translation for this. Yeah, let's not let's not get my thoughts on that one today. <clears throat> the righteousness of God through faithful the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in. Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. All right, I'm going to stop right there for a minute. So I do think it is important um, to to mention this. Y'all heard me say, some translations say, or ancient manuscripts say, that passage there most trans English translations we have will have prominently through faith in Jesus Christ. But um, in the Greek, um, it really probably reads more of through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, lifting up the faithfulness of Jesus to carry out the mission that he carried. In other words, because Jesus was obedient to do what and did what he did, we can then put our faith into Jesus. And that is an important piece to this, that um, the reason why we put our faith in Christ is because Christ himself was faithful to the mission of God um, in that. Now, I'm going to go to this Galatians passage, Galatians chapter 2, another Pauline text here. So um, let me pull that up. All right, Galatians chapter 2, and I am going to uh, start at verse 15. Um, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith, and and the text says by faith in Jesus Christ. But again, this would probably be more accurately translated, but through faith, through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith, by the faithfulness of Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Again, Paul getting at this understanding that the work of Jesus was was complete, like the work of Jesus, the atonement of Christ was complete, and because the work of Jesus is complete, we have a reason to put our faith in Jesus. Now, you may be asking yourself, you know, why are these translation discrepancies here? There's a lot of stuff about the Reformation and all this going in about works righteousness and and all that. But I don't think it really has to deal with that. I think we need to hear that Jesus himself was faithful, that Jesus himself was obedient to the mission that he was that he came to to do. He didn't run from that. I mean, look at the Garden of Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me. But ultimately, your will be done. Um, that statement of Christ, a faithful, uh, a faith, uh, a faithfulness. So, um, what do you guys think about that? Like this idea, the faithfulness of Jesus is why we can put our faith in Jesus. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I think the first passage that you uh, mentioned uh, does have specifically the translation issue. Did um, did the Romans passage have a footnote about that? Because that might be more accurately translated as faith in Christ. The, the Both the Romans and Galatians did. They had the footnote. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Um, and that upsets some people. Yeah. Um, but, but more than likely, it's upsetting the same people who are upset with any new translations of anything. Right. Um, and, and just to remember people, it's like, nobody's trying to do, do anything weird. It's no. simply that language does not have a one-to-one correlation with another language. It's, it is that confusing. That's um, right. Yeah. But, but Brett, the way that you have framed that the faithfulness of Christ is a foundation, but also the, you know, that couples with the fact that he is himself God incarnate. Right. Yeah, I buy it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do have to bring up because you you brought up a watchword that is actually in the question. You brought up the term "works righteousness," mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Which uh, there's a lot of a lot of kind of popular level discussion of well, we're saved by faith, not by works, and people misunderstand what works means. They think it's right. doing anything. Right. Right. But but it's more specific 
the, the context is better within, say, the sacrificial and cleanliness laws of, of the Jewish people. Um, this question alone says, what, is, what does God require of us to escape sin? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's faith in Christ. One repentance unto life. Two and the diligent use of all outward means by which Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption. Yeah, which, and that's an that's according to the Catechism required. Yes. So th- there are. We'll talk about means of that grace later um, in an upcoming episode. But it's important to realize. Hey, look. If Jesus is going to give you grace, don't you want to be everywhere where he's going to do that? Yes. Don't you want to do everything you can do where you know you'll receive it? Right. If it's behind the door, do you not want to open it? Right. And so the means of grace are the doors we open to receive it. I want so to run I just through think, it. I just run through it. Oh, I could run through it right now, buddy. I promise yeah. you that. Yeah. I need it. Um, yeah. Amen. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that's that's that strikes me as interesting since you yeah. brought that up. But I, well, I don't want to digress. And, and, I, from your and I'm point. glad you brought that clarification in because you've said before on this podcast when we talk about works righteousness in the context of this what the scripture is teaching, even both these passages, Rome, the Romans passage and the Galatians passage, is written in the context of the law itself, the Mosaic right. law, the Big L law, and so um, that is what that's what I, in my estimation is being talked about by salvation coming not by works but by faith um is it's having to do with that we it's not a uh it's not an excuse for us to not do anything in obedience to Jesus because when we're not being obedient then we are well we're in danger of other things oh be vague well <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in Wesleyan terms, we're in danger of throwing away our salvation, our faith, yeah. shipwrecking our faith. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I do. Let me make a, a kind of an inner spiritual note here, too. So, yes, works <clears throat> righteousness. You can't, you know, earn your salvation. That kind of popular phrase is true. It does not mean, however, that we don't have to respond through activity. Yeah. Yeah. Things like, Amen. you know, Amen. prayer. We don't pray because we have to simply because. God commands us. Right. We pray because we know it's a way that God communicates this continual saving grace to us. Amen. There's Amen. an internal aspect of that too, um, that you may or may not recognize. I certainly do, where just in the framework of my own thinking, I will engage or live in such a way where too much depends upon myself mm. and my own will. And that's a place to also just surrender, say, I can engage even prayer. Let's use prayer as an example. That's a means of grace. I can engage prayer as a way to earn something or to prove myself worthy. Right. Or I could use prayer as a way to commune and be receive God's grace. Yeah. So there's internal shifts too. I don't want to oversimplify and say, it's only about this. But when we're talking about you know, you don't have to do this or that to be saved. The, this, this question is talking about, there are things that are important for us to do to receive grace. I also want to make note that there's inner movements of our, of our spirit and thought patterns that can get in the way. Yeah. It's called surrender, baby. Amen. Amen. So if I may take a point of personal intellectual privilege here. Fine. Um, so Thomas Oden's got a fine set of volumes on the teachings of John Wesley, and he's taken pretty much all of his writings, the sermons, the notes, the journal entries, all of this stuff, and he has systematized it into almost like a Wesleyan systematic theology. And it's really beautiful and it's helpful. And I just want to read a few paragraphs from his volume on um, – John Wesley's teaching teachings on Christ and salvation. This is volume two of that series. Um, and the headline here is, What Then is Saving Faith? So this is Wesley's teachings. Grace is not enabled by faith. Faith is enabled by grace. Ah. To imagine that grace comes from faith turns the order of salvation on its head. Rather, grace makes faith possible. Faith is the disposition of the whole heart, mind, strength, and will to receive grace joyfully. In the apostolic preaching, faith is the sole condition of salvation. 
those who have faith are saved. Christian faith is then not only an assent to the whole gospel of Christ, but also a full reliance on the blood of Christ, a trust in the merits of his life, death, and resurrection, a recumbency on him as our atonement and our life, and as given, um, as given for us and living in us. Saving faith is a sure confidence which a man hath in God, that through the merits of Christ his sins are forgiven, and he is reconciled to the favor of God, and in the consequence hereof, a, cl a closing with him and cleaving to him as our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, or in one word, our salvation. Saving faith is this total trust, casting one's whole life on the truth manifested in the resurrected Christ. It is a disposition of the heart to embrace the hold, uh, to embrace and hold fast the merit of the Son dying on the cross. We are saved by grace through this active reliance and recumbency. And then he will just go on to say that saving faith renovates our relation to time. There are three tenses of time, pre present, past, and future. All tenses are transformed by saving faith. Faith saves from the power of present sin, from the guilt of past sin, and the fear of future, and from fear of future punishment. Faith saves from all sin. And I think Wesley, in his teaching on this, sums it up quite beautifully and wonderfully. Yeah, Absolutely. he uses a he uses a lot of a lot of fancy words though. Yeah, yeah, he does. Recumbency. When was the I last time it. I used that word? You know, you know the the beautiful thing about that is um, he talks about casting your whole life, yeah. uh, faith, uh, casting your whole life on Christ. And one of the things that the catechism is is kind of playing in is, well, I think it may be doing a better job than I think. But salvation, we often think about simply as uh, justification. Yeah, meaning that that kind of status change from uh, guilty to innocent. Yeah, um, and the uh, you know the subsequent regeneration, which comes from um, being alien to God to being a child of God. Right. Um, but salvation has a broader scope, and I th I think that the Catechism ultimately outs outlines it um, because the being escaping sin. Um, yes, you can be justified, but you can be then escape fully from it if you wanted to throw a Wesleyan yeah. um, emphasis there, which means that I may be justified, but uh, I can still be further saved, right? Doesn't right. mean that I, yeah. that I have to do more to, you know, quote, go to heaven when I die. Right. Um, but I, I personally love and have experienced this statement to be true. I have been saved. I am being saved, and, and I, I will be, be saved. Will in be fact, saved. you can see that in the Apostle Paul. He writes often about the hope of future salvation, right. though he is himself justified now. Right. What is that that phrase he uses? Not that I have obtained it, but I press yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's great. Um, and so then we come to uh, this. So that, that really deals with those first two questions. Now we're in that third question of what is repentance unto life then? What is this turning towards, turnings towards God? And um, I think Alan's got yeah. the passage from Acts and maybe even something from Joel with no, us. No, just, well, I can do Acts too. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> no, well, okay. I'm just making it up as I go. Yeah. <laughs> my, fav um, my favorite book is the book of Joel because he didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. <laughs> womp, womp, uh, Billy womp. Joel. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, <laughs> no, Acts... I'm going to double down on my Billy Joel. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Acts 2, 37 through 38. Uh, Peter has just finished preaching um, after Pentecost, um, or I guess we're still in Pentecost, um, that after the tongues of fire and, and, and all that. Um, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and yeah, whoa. I mean, uh, I mean, Peter does this whole transformation, right? I mean, Peter yeah, yeah. was um, 
you know, denied Christ. Um, Jesus appears to him after the resurrection and sort of reinstates him on the, on the shore. And then um, Pentecost happens. He's got the Holy spirit and he just goes on this wham, bam sermon and uh, the people respond and, and they say, what do you do? Repent, turn, um, basically turn from your evil ways, turn from your sin and turn to God and be baptized. Um, I mean, it, you know, uh, it reminds me, uh, so on uh, Mark, um, Jesus comes on the scene and what's, what's the thing he says? The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Um, I mean, that was the message, plain and simple, from Jesus in the beginning. Um, and then um, Joel 2, um, 12, I'm going to read 12 and 13. And this is, um, I, you know, we just said coming off of Ash Wednesday. Um, I, uh, um, I'm losing my words. But anyways, um, common passage for Ash Wednesday. Very common. Uh, yeah, we'll go with it. Yes, yes, I had a, <laughs> I had a much better word for it, but it's not there. Um, even now declares the Lord return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning rend your heart and not your garments return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love and he relents from sending calamity um return to me and it's like even now even even in your sinful even how bad <laughs> how much you disobeyed me. Even now, uh, I just beg for you to return to me with all your heart. Um, and I like that rend your heart, not your garments. We see throughout scriptures that um, God's people would, would tear their garments as an outward sign of their inward repentance. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes they would do that. At least when we get into sort of the Pharisees and so forth, um, they would do it and it, it's just for show. Um, yeah. It's just, yeah. it's just, a, it's just, a, it's just an outward show and there's nothing, no real change on the inside. And what God is saying is rend your hearts, not your garments. I, yeah. you know, if you're going to choose, if you got to choose between the two, tear your heart, yeah. make it, I want to make it new, um, uh, make it inward change, truly repent, turn from your sin and, um, turn to God. Um, I love with the, you know, the, um, with grief and hatred of, of, of sin is what our, was what the answer to the catechism says. Yeah. Um, and turn from it into God with full pep, with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. Yeah. So a fresh obedience, um, to, to God. So, um, rend your heart, not your garments. You know, what's interesting about that from Joel, if I'm not mistaken, and sometimes I get these minor prophets mixed up, which was in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, but I, if I'm not mistaken, Joel was a southern kingdom uh, Judah um, prophet. And what we know about Judah is continuously they're being told by Jeremiah and other um, prophets um, to repent or to turn from their, their ways because calamity is coming. Um, we know that the Babylonian captivity takes place. We know that happens. But even in those moments, even in the midst of calamity itself, even when um, uh, Judah fails to turn from their evil ways, fails to rend their hearts, you know, or, or, or in, uh, fails to do what is necessary, um, God still promotes a message of hope to the to this generation, uh, to the to these uh, to these people, even as they're being led into Babylon. Um, and one of the beautiful things I love about the love of God and the grace and the mercy of God is that it never gives up on us, right? It, even as we're being led away into captivity, God is still saying, but if you would just turn back to me, if you would just turn, even when they're in Babylon, read Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a prophet at the at the prophet of Babylon, basically, at the beginning stages of Babylon. He, there's so much in that about returning back to God, God bringing, what is it? The, 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 the dry bones, bringing life to the dry bones again, bringing, bringing life to the house of Israel again. Um, repentance, it, the, 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 the call for repentance or turning to the Lord is always there. It never ceases to be there. Yeah. And, there, and there's consequences, you know, there's, yeah, there's punishment because God is holy and just, and uh, we oftentimes forget that, but also there's grace and there's mercy. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Um, 
there is this, yeah, here it is. I, I, I had this question down. So in that first question of the catechism and the answer, you know, so what does God require of us that to that we may escape the wrath and curse to come? Um, it says to escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires it for us to have faith in Christ, repentance unto life with the diligent use of all outward means by which Christ communicates. That's the key by which Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption. So my question was, what are the outward means or what are the means in which Christ communicates to us? How does Christ communicate to us? I don't think we need to answer this question. It's cliffhanger. Oh, <laughs> you know what? I mean, you know, right? That's, I mean, well, I think so. Okay. I, I, I don't think, you know I what? think we got to leave our listeners wanting more, man. I think, you know what? I don't always agree with Alan Casey, but when I do, it's because he's right. And, uh, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> and he's, I think he's right about that. I think he's right about that. Maybe I was I mean, just getting ahead of myself yeah, a little bit. Because I can, I can already sense the heart rate of our listeners rising. They're so <laughs> deeply invested in this conversation. They will tune in. Oh, yeah. yeah right. Week. Yeah. I mean, because, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why, why wouldn't they? Yeah, honestly, they want to find out. I mean, if they don't listen to the next episode, they won't find out the answer, and they're going right. to just be le- le- left wondering. Right. Well, <laughs> that's <just> true. <laughs> um, I wrote down this question, and um, I don't even know if it's a fair question to ask. Um, but then do it. Okay. Um, why is Jesus necessary for salvation? Um, if God loves us, um. I mean, what what is it about? What why is Jesus necessary for salvation? Now, Jim and I we sit on a board of uh, of of um, credentialing board for the, our denomination um, called the Board of Ordained Ministry. Alan has sat on that board before as well, and they we on that on that board we listen to sermons, we listen to uh, we read different paperwork on teaching and um, and doctrine. We read people's. Uh, views of doctrine and, and whatnot, their understanding of doctrine. And um, sometimes it is, is a challenge for, for us to read. Be- and I don't want to get too much into that. But just because it's long, it, because it's long. Yes. Um, but wh- one of the big things that we come up, there's some basic doctrinal stuff that comes up. And one of them is the need for divine grace and um, the need for, you know, the Lordship of Jesus. Like that's a big one, you know, but what is your understanding of the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And so this question of why is Jesus necessary? Why is Jesus necessary? And um, I wanted to see if my guys here can give a kind of pithy statement to um, why Jesus, what their view of why Jesus is necessary for salvation. Take it away, Diet Coke. (laughs) Take it away, Diet Coke. My brain's fried. Um, (laughs) Well, I think he's the he's the uh, he's the payment for our sins. He he was he's the perfect lamb. I mean, we could you know we've talked about I think it was last episode. Where there's there's multiple theories of atonement, um, um, and how Christ makes us one with God. I think they're all there. A lot of them have a a part to play in ex- explaining um, why Christ is necessary. Um, we we are incapable of saving ourselves. So we needed someone else uh, to do that and someone who lived a perfect life, and that is Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, but also um, through the power of God was able to overcome death. And so mm-hmm. um, yeah. there's, the, there's the payment for our sins and his death, and there's the, um, um, the resurrection that gives us new life. So mm-hmm. I don't know. That's, uh, that's my short, quick answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My shortest answer is because that's the way in which God chose to reconcile people to himself. Well, I could have done that too, Jim. <laughs> well, and, I just, I just, and no, I think it's great. No, I mean, that is, I mean, that, that is that's, that's true. the truth. It's yeah. true. And, yeah. because, and, and because um, if you really meditate on what it means that God became flesh and dwelt among mm-hmm. us, it's a big deal that human flesh is human humanity recreated re uh restored into the image of god there's perfect humanity ascended into heaven alongside perfect divinity because of yeah. jesus and partially because god doesn't just want us to you know not receive the curse 
but God wants us to fulfill the greatest purpose to love yeah. him and enjoy him forever. And he chose that becoming among, coming among us, taking on humanity would bridge that gap. And so it's not just that there was, it's, it's a different question. If you say, well, Jesus, if you forget that Jesus was fully divine as well, and just say that somebody needed to die, um, that sounds, that sounds crazy. But why, if God loves us so much, did, is Jesus necessary? Because God loves us so much that he wanted to sacrifice himself to rescue and ransom us. Yes, that's, I, I, I love that. Um, and the fact that you use rescue and ransom. Um, we, threw that, out- we threw that beside the propitiation and the sacrifice. Right. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, Phil Talon and basic, uh, ba- um, the absolute. Um, absolute basics of the Christian faith, he uses uh, the words uh, rescue and reconciliation as the definition of salvation. Um, and um, I like that. I, you know, for me, uh, I think all of that's true. Absolutely. I agree both with Alan and with Jim. And there's uh, probably more and more reasons why we can give to this. Um, for whatever reason, even in this moment, one of the things that I think about is when Jesus himself says, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, I came to fulfill them, that they would be fulfilled in me. That the, we, we need to remember that within the law and the prophets was a promise, right? It was a promise of, 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 there's, of salvation itself, of God revealing himself breaking through, making a people into a, uh, a, a missional people for the nations so that God could be known to the nations. And Jesus fulfills that, like he, he, he fulfills that in himself so that we can be the people we were created to be. So much like what Jim said and, he, and Alan as well, is that the reason that Jesus is necessary is because he's part of the plan, that, that he is the plan. He is the, I mean, that is what was set up from the very from the very beginning was this right here. Well, Jesus. You, you think about this too. Um, in the beginning, the word spoke, the word was yeah. spoken, right? Yeah. Right. And humanity was created. All things were created by that word. And Jesus is the word speaking again to recreate. Right. Mm, yep. And so, I mean, it really yes. starts to come together the more you meditate on. Well, and I think, nature. you know, people get upset, you know, people can, you know, come back and say, well, why is Jesus the way, you know, why is, why is Jesus the plan? Yeah. Um, Just be thankful there is a plan. Exactly. Amen. Exactly. Hallelujah. I mean, God loves us so much that He made a way, that He made a plan. And um, yes. Or he, we could just be stuck without one. Yes. And um, yeah. and we, we get upset that, that Jesus is the way. It's like, come on. Yeah. I mean, um, thankfully there um, is a way. Gosh, that yeah. is a way. Yeah. You know, a lot of times Alan has the comment of the of the uh, of the episode. It just comes out of nowhere, boom, boom, boom. But I'm going to give it to Game Ball goes to Jim Morrow. Dude, we need a we need like a little uh, thing to pass around. Well, we it's do. only because it's only because he stole my last line. I mean, like really. <laughs> I mean, I want to come on. I want to Game, Game Ball, ball to Jim Morrow. Hey, or, we don't get participation trophies here on the Pot of Keys. Hey, here's what happens: dream teamwork <laughs> makes the dream work. Okay, teamwork makes the dream. Oh, work. There's no I in team, but there is in win. There is an M. <laughs> there is an M and an E. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. That's true too. That's true too. All right, this has been great. What a great episode, guys. Thank you all uh, so much. This is such good stuff there. Um, we are going to uh, uh, go ahead and, and close this episode out because we do have a cliffhanger that's just yes, kind of hanging do. there now, yeah. just waiting for a new episode. A question that has not been answered. Uh, yeah, a question that has not been answered. And so we're just going to leave that loose end dangling there and, um, and, and hit it on the next episode in which we will be talking about the means of grace. The means of grace. So... Uh, uh, just a reminder that uh, the Podakesis podcast is part of the Spirit and Truth Podcasting Network. You can find out more about that at spiritandtruth.life. And in just a couple of weeks, there will be the Spirit and Truth Conference, March 17th through the 19th in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, I don't think it's too late for you to register for that. And if you would like to know more about that, go to spiritandtruth.life and you'll see information right there on that front page of that website. Hit us up on social media at Podakesis is where you can find us. Got any questions or comments you would like to leave, you can do so at uh, questions at podakesis.com. You can also leave a voicemail, 404-635-6679. That's 404-635-6679. I don't know why I tripped over that. Um, 
Uh, and who knows, your voicemail may make it on an episode. So uh, be sure to leave a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. And uh, guys, y'all have anything else you'd like to say before we shut it down for today? Uh, sorry, my mouth is full of Diet Coke. I can't really see it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> all right. With that being said, uh, we'll talk to y'all. Uh, why am I having such trouble? We'll talk to you later, Hotic humans. Y'all have a great one. Bye.